Hey, what's going on guys? It's Alex here. Today, I'm going to talk about this strange little language called Piet. Piet is a esoteric programming language named after this dude named Piet Mondrian. I don't speak French, but I looked it up on YouTube and the first video I came across called it that, so I'm just going to go with that. For those of you who don't know, Mondrian was the dude who created those weird, like, abstract, simple color pictures. So eventually some guy comes around and he's like, alright, I want to make a whole programming language where the programs are actually images that look like that artwork. And so he did, and he called it Piet. That fact alone makes this a pretty interesting little language. Instead of actually typing stuff up, you actually create PNG files, or just depends on the interpreter, but basically any sort of image file and it'll run that as if it were code. So let's take a look at it real quick. But before we move on, YouTube Analytics tells me like 90% of my viewers are not subscribed. So if you aren't, make sure you go ahead and subscribe just real quick. All right, let's take a look at how Piet works. All the information I'll be talking about in this video, I have gotten from the Piet official website. Now, a lot of the details actually change based on individual interpreters. Apparently a whole community has grown up around this language, so there's no one definitive interpreter, but I've been using one that's online by this dude named Bert Nace, and I'll have a link to both that and the official website in the description. So Piet programs, first of all, look like this. This is how you might write hello world. So there's a few things we have to break down with this. In Piet, we have these things called codels, which is, I think it was like a super pixel. So a lot of these programs, you know, you're writing by individual pixel. Now you might scale that up where each pixel is maybe like 25 by 25, just that way it's easier to see. You know, maybe bigger, might be like 100 by 100. So the smallest unit, the smallest square unit the Piet interpreter finds within your code becomes the codel size. If you have blocks of the same color, of like 12 by 12, then your codel size becomes 12. You don't have to worry about putting that in, at least for Bert Nace's interpreter. It'll just figure that out on its own. So that's great. So we're programming with these pixels of size 12 and we're making images with them. Codels can be put in together to create these color blocks, which again are all the same color, uh, and they can be any shape. They don't have to be like a square. Any shape, any size, doesn't matter. Now these color blocks are one of like 18 different actual colors. 20 if you're gonna count white and black. And I'll basically just explain what the different colors do, and then we can get into execution and how the interpreter actually goes through these color blocks. These 18 colors that aren't white or black actually form all the data inside your Piet program. So what it is, if you create a color block of like 18 different codals, all the same color, then that actually represents the number 18 in your Piet program. Because this language only takes in data in the form of integers. You can't define a negative number unless if you use like minus like you know, five minus seven or something like that. You can't just straight up define a negative primitive. You have to get that using some sort of calculation on two positive integers. But it's actually very simple. You can use any of those 18 different colors to create your own number. Now, it doesn't automatically push that number onto the stack because yes, Piet is a stack-based language, but at least you have that data. Now, if you wanna actually push that data onto the stack to be able to use it on a different computation, well, pushing is its own command in Piet. So now we're gonna take a look at these commands. So all the commands in Piet are activated by if you have a color block of one color next to a color block of a different color. And the difference between those two colors corresponds to some command. There are 18 different colors you can use in Piet because there are six different actual hues and three degrees of lightness for each hue. So for example, if we had the lightest, brightest hue, so light red, and if next to that we had one step darker but the same hue, so like medium red, that would actually push whatever data we had in the light red section onto the stack. And then from there we can do that again to put some other number on the stack. And then next to that if we had, say, a different color that was no change in lightness but one step change in hue, then we would add those two numbers together. So Piet is an entire stack-based language where data is defined in collections of pixels, 
or codels, and then computation is actually defined based on the difference of those codel states that are next to each other. And then white codels is sort of like a comment, like the interpreter would just pass over without doing anything. And then black is a little interesting. So black, you can use that to help stop your program and sort of change the direction that the interpreter is moving in as it interprets your code. So now that we've gone over all of the like color types and what they do and the basic data and computation and stack model, let's go into actual execution steps in Piet. Okay, so Piet has two state integers that kind of help it in this execution. It has a direction pointer and a code out chooser. The direction pointer is actually kind of simple. It sort of shows you in which direction is the interpreter moving as it searches through your code. The cool thing about Piet is that it's not linear like all programming languages are in its instruction times. It's actually two dimensional, which is pretty cool. Actually, I might try creating a 3D language one day. I think that'd be pretty awesome. The direction pointer basically tells you in which direction you're going to look to grab the next block in your execution. And you start automatically in like the upper left corner of your program. And the direction pointer is facing right to start out with. Now the code I'll choose here, you can think of there are two arrows on either side of the direction pointer arrow. And I'll, I'll have a graphic on the screen here because it's kind of hard to visualize. After your program is done interpreting that current block that you're on, you go towards the direction pointer all the way to the edge of that block. And then you have your code out chooser, which says, okay, am I going to go all the way to the right compared to the direction pointer and then get that code out and then move on from there? Or am I going to go all the way to the left? So the direction pointer can go in any of the four cardinal directions. And then imagine once you're already pointing in that direction, you have, you can go either left or right. It's a little confusing, but if you can visualize it like I'm doing here on the screen, then it gets a lot easier to understand. And then once you've gone to that point in your current color block, you'll go, you'll take a step over in the direction of your direction pointer. And then basically you just continue on execution just like that. Now, if you've gotten to a black codal or if you got into the edge of the screen, there's a instruction set for how to either turn around or just stop. Now, admittedly, I don't quite understand it as well as I do, but I'll just read off this section from the website for you. Black color blocks and the edges of the program restrict program flow. Okay, well, that was kind of redundant. I already said that. But if the Piet interpreter attempts to move into a black block or off an edge, it is stopped and then the Kodo chooser is toggled. So if it was right, it becomes left. If it was left, it becomes right. All that stuff. The interpreter then attempts to move from its current block again. If it fails the second time, the direction pointer is moved clockwise one step. These attempts are repeated with the Kodo chooser and the direction pointer being changed between alternate attempts. If after eight attempts, the interpreter cannot leave its current color block, there is no way out and the program terminates. So I am having kind of a hard time visualizing this. So actually I won't be programming anything in Piet in this video. So I'll be splitting this video into two parts. I'll make this video, I'll watch it. So I'll actually know how to get my program to stop uh, because I tried programming in Piet and I w just wanted to print out 25. So it's going in an infinite loop printing out 25, but you know, at least it's printing out what I wanted it to. So I'm gonna make part one, I'm gonna watch it and I'm gonna learn Piet from my own video so that in part two, you can actually see me just programming all sorts of stuff in this weird little esoteric language. Okay, and that's all I have for this week. So thank you all so much for watching. If this helped you understand Piet, that's really good because I need it to help me understand Piet myself. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving me a like, share, comment, subscribe, follow my social media, or click the little notification bell. Uh, apart from that, I don't have too much else to say, so thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next week.